Let's welcome to the CJU Yieldify main stage, Senior Campaign Manager from CJ, Christina Tobacco. By a show of hands, who here can recall a time where they were recently influenced? Don't worry, I'm not, wow, that is a lot of hands. As someone who spends way too much time on social media, I'm influenced to the point of purchase a couple times a month. In fact, I can remember the very first time that I was influenced to make a purchase by a social media influencer. The year was 2009, and I recall watching makeup tutorial videos on YouTube from users like Bethany Moda and Michelle Fawn. I would write down the products they would use, bring it into Macy's, and proudly present it to the woman at the MAC makeup counter. They then package everything up, and I'd hurry home to test out my new eyeshadows, brushes, and blushes. While I didn't know it then, this passion for consuming creator content would lead to a career in influencer marketing. Hello, everyone. My name is Christina Tobacco, and I'm a senior campaign manager on the CJ Influence team here at CJ. My role is to oversee the strategy and execution of influencer campaigns and ongoing influencer programs on behalf of our clients. And I'm very much looking forward to the discussion I will be moderating today, all about influencer marketing. But before we bring up our esteemed panelists of industry experts, I wanna take you all down a journey to explore where influencer marketing has been so we can better understand where the industry is headed. Over the years, influencer marketing has evolved with the emergence and adoption of new platforms by consumers. And similar to Taylor Swift's current Eras Tour, the industry has experienced different eras of its own. Prior to influencer marketing as it exists today, we had and still have celebrity endorsements, where well-known figures license their likeness to brands like Wheaties or engage in co-branded partnerships like Michael Jordan with Nike, to help build trust in the brand through the lens of the well-known individual. Then, with the rise of the internet in the early 2000s, brands had the opportunity to connect with consumers through mommy bloggers, which allowed them to tap into niche communities of parents, and they proved to be more relatable to the everyday consumer. The late 2000s saw the emergence of YouTube vloggers, which share, who would share haul videos, product reviews, and share an intimate look at their personal lives with their subscribers. The first VidCon was hosted in July of 2010 with the purpose of bringing creators together to network. Just three months later, Instagram launched and became a game changer in the space. I vividly remember the emergence of the food eats first trend where people would take photos of their food and post it on Instagram before eating it. Those with a serious passion for this trend would then go on to become food bloggers and influencers and work with restaurants and food brands. Over the past few years, the hashtag TikTok made me buy it has amassed over 67 billion uses on the platform, which epitomizes TikTok's transformative impact on consumer purchasing behavior. It shows how everyday people can become trusted product endorsers and leverage their newfound influence to help brands increase awareness, consideration, and drive sales. Now look, there's always going to be a new era right around the corner. Today, more and more brands are looking to invest in influencer marketing. But with more sponsored content streaming through our smartphones, how does your brand stand out? And more importantly, how does your team combat emerging challenges such as de-influencing, a recent trend where influencers distance themselves from brands or products they once promoted. Oops, went too quick. Um, luckily, this conversation is just getting started and I have three pieces of advice to set you on the right path forward. The first, do not go into a campaign with a blank canvas. It is essential to have a primary goal to serve as your north star throughout the campaign. This will then allow you to set a strategic foundation and make optimizations to correct course if and when necessary. Next, identify the appropriate measurement tools to help you evaluate performance. 
Our team uses Fluency, which is our platform to measure, measure social KPIs in conjunction with CJ's suite of tools to measure performance data, one of which being affiliate customer journey that you heard Mayor talk about earlier today. This invaluable resource allows us to discern how influencer efforts contribute to an overall revenue boost within your affiliate program. We'll take the generated revenue of influencers and add that to the revenue of other publishers they've assisted in securing the last click. Next, success is rooted in long-term relationships. Influencers are not mere billboards for promotional content. They're dynamic personalities whose audiences have come to trust their recommendations. And because they're human, it is imperative to establish and maintain relationships with those who yield strong performance and share similar values as your brand. Some of the strategies that our CJ Influence team uses to achieve this is getting on concept and calls with creators to talk about the shared vision for their content, instead of just simply sending them a messaging brief and expecting content in return. We'll also acknowledge their major life milestones, like the birth of a new child, by sending them a gift. Going the extra mile can have a lasting impact on your program often in the form of additional placements at little to no additional cost. As a general rule of thumb, as performance increases, you'll want to spend more time nurturing that relationship. My final piece of advice, integrate your influencer efforts across your marketing team, which will allow you to stretch the relationships that you've built with your influencer partners. Later, we'll talk about how your paid social team can use influencer content Instead of, spending ex on extend, excuse me, instead of spending money on expensive content shoots, and also, according to Lumanu, influencer-generated content performs three times better than brand-produced ads. Now, we are CJ, so we also advocate for influencer efforts to have a backbone in the affiliate channel for tracking and measurement purposes. This will then allow your team to properly measure the full robust of their efforts across your marketing team. I want this number to really sit with you. $143 billion. Just realized I'm standing right in front of the screen. Um, $143 billion is how much revenue is projected to be driven by influencer marketing by the year 2030. So my question to you is, how does your team plan to invest your budgets strategically to make the most impact for your brand. Luckily, this conversation is just getting started. And at this time, I'd like to welcome our three panelists to the stage so they can share some more tactical advice for how to elevate your influencer programs. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Sarah Lim, Kyle Yomseth, and Emily Hare. Awesome. Emily, Kyle, and Sarah, thank you so much for being here. I'd love for each of you to introduce yourselves with our audience. Emily, we can start with you. Sure. Hey, everyone. I'm Emily. I'm Global Influencer Director at Publicist based out of London. So I'm based in the global content team where we need a center of excellence uh, across all the group's different influencer propositions. So I lead Fluency Product Development, which is the tool that Christina mentioned for our influencer teams to source and manage influencers, as well as developing different pieces of thought leadership and connecting our groups uh, around the world for different multi-market pitches, things like that. Hi, I'm Kyle. Uh, I'm not as mean as I look in my photo. Um, I started uh, an influencer talent management firm about nine years ago. My wife was my first talent, and now we have about 150 exclusive talent under management, making us the largest independent talent management firm for influencers in the US, which is GNB Digital Management. I also started in 2019 the College of Influence because uh, I saw my friends in this industry getting taken advantage of in all their contracts and whatnot. So we've created a platform where we're really out there to educate the next wave of influencers and really change the dynamic of what digital literacy means for the next generation. So excited to add to the conversation and thanks for having us. Of course. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm the senior marketing manager at KiwiCo. We are a children's enrichment company um, and I oversee affiliates and influencers with 
which are two separate channels at KiwiCo. Fantastic. I think we can dive into our first question. There's a discourse online led by creators that claims influencers are not salespeople and shouldn't be responsible, responsible for achieving sales. I'd love to hear each of your takes on the argument. Kyle, we can start with you. Yes, I love this question because when Sarah asked me, I have like the corniest answer possible. Like, I 100% agree with the idea that they're not salespeople. It's social media, it's not sales media, and we need to stop you know, treating these influencer partners like they're just there to push the dollars. I know that's what everybody wants, but if you're really going to like honor the space and, and what we're all on social media primarily for, it's about building a community. It's about actually tapping into these, the, the lifestyle of the person that you know, you're, you're contracting with and the, the people that have grown around that lifestyle. You can't immediately expect them to push performance unless they're able to fully create a story around your brand. So that is my long-winded answer to, yes, I agree with that notion that they're not salespeople, but I think we're gonna talk a lot about how do we help engineer the best kind of results um, in this conversation. Exactly, and so Sarah, I'm specifically curious to hear your thoughts on this. I know we were chatting Maybe about this earlier. <laughs> yeah, um, I first wanna say, like, I think I understand where the talent is coming from um, when they say that. And I think it's um, kind of twofold. Their contractual obligation is to create content, not to be committed to a certain volume of sales that they're gonna drive. And I think it comes from this frustration that a lot of creators have where they might put a lot of work and effort and time into creating content, and then the brand that they're working with isn't happy with it because it didn't generate sales. So I think that's kind of where it comes from. Um, but I think it would just benefit just both brands and influencers to just think about what it means to, for a brand to partner with an influencer. Yes. Because in the same vein as influencers are creators, not salespeople, um, coming from the brand perspective, I would say brands are a business, not a content generation <laughs> platform. Um, our goal isn't to just put out high quality content. So ultimately, that means that we need to see some business value. We need to see some return on our investments. So in my opinion, I think we kind of need to flip that around a little bit and say, like, influencers may not be salespeople, but they are business partners. And I think any business partnership, um, any good one, both parties are kind of mutually benefiting, mutually you know, getting profits out of it. Um, they're both finding value in it. And maybe even most importantly, like they're both motivated for that partnership to succeed. Um, so I think that is the kind of ideal scenario. So I understand their sentiment. I just think it's maybe a little bit aggressive <laughs> coming from the brand side. Um, I just think we need a I will think of it at a different angle. I think there's definitely a happy medium here, and I think it's also fair to expect that influencers won't necessarily make a sale the first time they partner with a brand. And so, you know, having those conversations with the creator partners, you know, as the brand, I think is really important in setting those expectations. Um, so it kind of sounds like there's a happy medium there. But Emily, I'd love to hear your take on it as well. Yeah, I like I largely agree. I like that partnership point. I think like influencers aren't salespeople, but they can be. So we really think about them as part of that full funnel. So they can build awareness, they can sell products as well. I think from a creator's point of view, they're really thinking about how like to balance the amount of content they're putting out. They don't want everything to be a sales message. They want the brands that they're collaborating with to be a natural partner. Uh, and they want to potentially be something that they usually consider using or would want to share with their audience. So they're really thinking about the kind of flow of content that they're putting out and making sure that they don't alienate any of their audience or people that are watching their content. So I think, like we're saying, there's a good happy medium that I think, um, yeah, you can use influencers to the best extent if you're thinking about that full funnel journey rather than just the kind of sales point of it. And kind of going off of that, Emily, you just touched upon this. Sales isn't always the goal of a campaign. so. I'm very curious to hear specifically, Emily and Sarah, how you activate different influencers to achieve these various objectives. Sure. Shall I go with you? 
Go right ahead, keep it going. <laughs> um, so, yeah, when we're working with the brand, we'd be looking, uh, like you are saying, actually, in your slides, setting out the KPIs, who are their audience, who are they trying to reach, and then we'd start to use a tool like Fluency to dive into who is going to appropriately meet that and really vet them to see if the content that they're producing is of a certain quality, would suit the brand and their kind of attributes if the audience matches up with who the brand is trying to target uh, and then kind of approach them and, and set about working with them in that way. Sarah, what are your thoughts? Um, so we tend to look at bloggers and YouTubers as kind of um, the best ways to generate evergreen content that has the potential to drive sales kind of way past their original publishing date. Mm -hmm. So I would say that has been the most successful at KiwiCo as far as driving revenue and sales as the primary goal. Mm -hmm. um, and then as far as social media platforms outside of that, we see that Instagram, Reels, and TikToks do tend to be better for brand awareness, um, but sales is always kind of the bigger priority um, across all channels in my org. Um, so what we typically do is, even if we are contracting Instagram Reels or TikToks, um, we will then kind of turn that into a sales engine by using paid social budget to run it as a paid media ad through the influencer's handles, so that that way we can scale last click sales a lot, to be a lot larger than what that organic post would be able to do by itself. Makes a lot of sense and kind of goes into the fact of integrating across your marketing team, all of your efforts. So Sarah, you sit on, you oversee influencer and affiliate, but you also sit on that paid social team. Are there any other examples of how you integrate across the marketing department, maybe working with your PR team or anything like that? Yeah, I would say paid social is the biggest one. Um, but outside of that, we also help out our creative team. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure there are other brands like this too, but I feel like our creative team is always strapped for time. Um, and with that, um, especially at KiwiCo, because we are selling products that are for kids, it can be hard to be constantly pumping out new imagery and new videos featuring kids and featuring like a diversity amongst those kids. Um, so we will utilize influencer content as, as essentially UGC to use across like email, um, our website even, so across channels, um, when we can get the usage rights for them. Definitely, very strong strategy to really stretch those relationships. Kyle, I'm specifically curious from your perspective, how are you navigating conversations with brands when you know their KPIs to help make recommendations to encourage them to work with specific creators to reach those KPIs? Yeah, it's a great question in terms of like how do we how do we pick? You know, we're sitting in the middle between the the brand and and an agency. Typically, I would say like 98% of the business that we do comes from an agency versus brand direct. And when we've got the KPIs, like the first thing I want to know are in the goals and, and are the expectations aligned? You mm. know, like are we really coming to the middle? Which I I think you know everybody here is filleted up. We've got to come to the middle and really understand. Are these expectations appropriate for what I'm gonna get out of the influencers in front of me? Because um, one of the things we could talk about is just, you know, in terms of I could have an influencer that's got the best, like highest clicks out there, at which we have lots of talent that are really just click-centric converters. But on the brand side, is the brand really set up appropriately in terms of their funnel to use those clicks and then, of course, help the conversion chain happen? So part of it for me is like, okay, is my talent going to show up and make the best content for them mm -hmm. from a brand awareness perspective? But are they aligned with like the brand ethos? We look at that first. We look, okay, is um, what my talent's creating, is it kind of similar to what other talent they've been using? So we're like, look and feel. And then the KPIs themselves, do those match? Do I know that I can drive enough clicks or whatever their other KPIs might be that is going to actually help them achieve whatever the goal might be? So it's got to be actually like a lot more holistic in terms of how we look at it, mm. you know, as the talent ma management agency when we're paring them down to say, okay, is this gonna, is it gonna fit? Is it gonna hit? Am I going to bring the most to the table? Even though I know the brand also has to have like, a, like again, a well-aligned funnel on the other side. It's not so black and white choosing creators for a campaign. There's so many variables that go into, oh, go ahead, Emily. Yeah, I was just gonna add in. So one thing that you can do that's quite interesting, I think, is use the, um, like best 
forming content that influencers in that space are creating, maybe to form part of the brief or right. uh, like effect. And we get that all the time. Actually, that's a great point. So a lot of the briefs that we'll receive from an agency or from a brand will actually show me people that I know that are either represented by us or my friends in the industry because it's like, to the, the point Emily was making, it is the best performing content. They want to see more of that. Mm -hmm. So it's great that when the briefs are being made, they're, you know, at least you know, you're aware of that, that your team is being conscious of, okay, let's show them the path mm -hmm. to success. And we always ask this question too, uh, when we're dealing with a brand or an agency, can you show us examples of what you want to see? Can you send us links yeah. so that we know, you know, we want to, I want my talent to be set up for the most success possible so that we can continue that relationship beyond and we can, you know, book for the, the holiday, we can book beyond, we can do the next ambassadorship. So again, it's got to be like all of these things, the, the different dynamics hitting at the same time. I think that's a really good takeaway for the audience as you're building out messaging briefs is to include those examples of strong performing content. Um, if you're taking notes, I, I might write that one down. I actually had one other like quick sure. example of a brand that some may know that I think does an incredible job of this. And, and Kiwi is certainly um, does it too, especially because I've seen the briefs. But Seed, if anybody's familiar with Seed, does an incredible job of educating the talent. They actually won't let talent get on to their marketing campaigns unless they've gone through specific education about the products that they're gonna be sharing out there. And that's sure. really important because what Seed is doing is they're teaching the unique selling proposition. They're showing the talent these call to actions that they wanna see. And so that when the talent actually parrot those and uses the USPs, mm -hmm. they're seeing a higher conversion typically out of those talent. And they require it before, uh, like I said, every campaign that they do. We forget you know, the industry is only about 12 years old, maybe mm. if we're talking about like strict influencer, it's 10, eight years old, that these people have not, influencers haven't received a degree in influence. You know, mm. it's, um, they're out there creating communities. You know, many of them are not trying to be the biggest converters out there. They're trying to create great content. So we've got to educate them about our, what our products are doing, why they're great, give them all those little sound bites and things and the examples, and then let them do their work. It's interesting that you bring up that educational piece, and it sounds like you know that takes a level of effort to meet with your partners or create materials for them to learn that. It makes me think of you know running influencer campaigns versus ongoing programs and the, and the amount of time that you invest into your creator partners. So I'm curious if there are thoughts on that topic of you know, running a campaign versus an ongoing program specifically, and maybe what are some of the benefits or challenges? I see Emily nodding. Yeah, I think like that's definitely the direction we're seeing the industry going in, is like setting up more of those long-term relationships and building kind of platforms that influencers can play off rather than thinking campaign by campaign. And if you just think about it from a creator's point of view, they get to know the brand that much more they don't have that kind of fear of failure for a single post, so they can actually experiment a bit more, create things that they know their audience are going to really engage with. And so I think, like, long term, it's, it's going to lead to a more positive outcome, both on the creator side and the brand side. Yeah, I think on the brand side, like, long term relationships, um, it all depends on the influencer, of course, but I think it can lead to a lot of good things for the brand. One of them is just, if, um, if you have a long-term relationship, you're also more likely to get you know, casual organic mentions. Mm -hmm. um, you might have more flexibility in terms of pricing for you know, the subsequent campaigns. Um, and I think something that is clear from our metrics is that the more an influencer mentions a brand, like the higher their conversion rates get, because when an influencer mentions a brand once and then kind of never mentions it again. It's not really top of mind for their followers. Whereas if they're mentioning it repeatedly, it gets people curious. It comes off as more authentic, like they are real fans of that brand, not just getting paid to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, and and that just, that is extremely helpful. Um, but I think another thing to consider is that like, in, I, I'm sure you have stories on this too, but I feel like Influencers follow each other and influence mm -hmm. each other. So it can even lead to like more influencer partners for the brand because like because they influence each other, they might talk about their brand deals to other influencers. And if they're a no, good they fit, do. then it's yeah. Might, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's a huge plus for the brand. Yeah, just to add like one other part of that, um, 
And I, I think it's correct, like there's a lot of brands in the audience. I see a lot of orange them. lanyards. Yeah, <laughs> so one of the biggest points that I think we can tie all of this around is the fact that if you're out there doing a lot of this one and done marketing versus, I mean, I, I'm just gonna say the era of one and done marketing should be over. And I think we're, we're gonna keep pushing towards that. It should be more about the ambassadors, the ongoing programs. Because if you're into the one and done, and that's been popular since I started about nine years ago doing this, essentially you're throwing spaghetti against the wall. You are giving the power of your brand and your brand name away to a bunch of people that you know may be unknown, may take it in a direction you totally don't want it to go to. Whereas if you're actually, you've got this ongoing relationship, you're building, again, a meaningful story, a meaningful relationship. Uh, you're potentially growing the size of your cohort of influencers here because uh, like Sarah said, it's, it's, um, you're growing, or they're talking to each other. And it, that's, it's a lot safer for your brand to be ongoing than to just kind of keep popping it out there and seeing what works. And to the point that Emily made, uh, if you do allow them to you know, be ongoing, then they're gonna be able to learn from their own mistakes perhaps, or like, hey, this didn't hit, why? Okay, next one I'm mm -hmm. gonna change it up and do it differently. So you're gonna see growing success together. And that's really important. So I'm curious because obviously our brands only have a finite amount of budget to work with. And so how do you balance working with a creator on a test partnership versus integrating them into a long-term partnership? How much uh, time do you give them to sort of prove themselves and how do you sort of navigate that? Um, so <laughs> so like it's, it's <laughs> tough because um, we know long-term relationships work, but the reality is that like, not every influencer relationship is gonna turn into that. Mm -hmm. um, what I would encourage brands to do is obviously rebooking successful partners is kind of the easy, mm -hmm. no-brainer thing to do, but I would say um, be willing to retest partners that show promise. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, we've worked with influencers where um, we love their content, it aligns really well with the brand, very authentic, um, they're driving traffic to the KiwiCo site, and they are driving some sales as well, but our ROAS doesn't look great because the volume of sales wasn't enough to justify like their rate. Um, in those cases, we'll often go back to them and say like, we loved your content, we really wanna rebook you and work with you again, but like based on the last integration, ROAS wasn't really meeting our goals, like are you willing to be flexible on pricing so we can try it out again? Um, and that's where it goes back to you know long-term relationships and flexibility on pricing because if you show enthusiasm for the content they're creating and a willingness to work with them again, then those conversations around pricing are a lot easier. I will co-sign that KiwiCo like, definitely does this well and we've had this in terms of um, just laying out the, the exact like this didn't work that well. We love what you created. It mm. didn't work as well as we had hoped, but we want to, you know, like putting out that olive branch, we want to try it again. And I think it's really important to just say, hey, if it doesn't work again, yeah. like it's cool that we amicably go separate sure. ways for now, but uh, your company does a great job of actually like putting it out there where a lot of brands don't even know what their KPIs are to start with. Um, aren't willing to say, hey, the, this is really what we're looking for so that the talent knows. And, um, and then again, be willing to like try and just say, okay, cool, it did work or it didn't work or you know, figure out a way to kind of keep the conversation going but also cut when it, it just uh, it hasn't turned out, it hasn't panned out. Yeah, I, I definitely think that's fair to do. And Very fair. I think, you know, just taking a look at my notes on the time. Um, I think it, we can kind of go back to basics here and think about creative concepting. Getting on a call with a creator, like we were talking about earlier, and giving them feedback can be helpful, but to your point, if it's not gonna work out, it's not gonna work out, and like, to, like you said, sometimes it makes sense to go your separate ways. Um, I'm curious if, you know, how affiliate marketing, more specifically affiliate tracking and measurement comes into play when you're analyzing who to continue to work with, if there's maybe specific KPIs that you're looking at um, or, or tools out there that you, that you would use? Oh. <laughs> I'll go. Um, so for us, I would say the affiliate platform is helpful because it kind of, it houses all the reporting where we can see who's performing organically. 
obviously I realize not every influencer um, is joined to the affiliate platform, but um, at least I've found that there will always be influencers that are and are having organic mentions. So that's a good starting place because it might be that you know they're already mentioning the brand organically. Clearly, it's resonating enough with their audience to drive some sales. Um, maybe we can scale that further if mm. we invest in flat fees. Um, so I think that's a plus in kind of integrating everything within the affiliate program. And then on the media side, what we could often do is look and see what pieces of content are performing well and then put paid spend behind them, assuming that's been kind of negotiated in, in advance. And with that, you can reach maybe a different audience or yeah, a slightly new set of the audience that you wouldn't have done otherwise. So that can mm -hmm. really grow the reach of the, yeah, and the effectiveness of the campaign. Definitely. Shifting gears a little bit, um, According to a study by Captera, 41% of marketers believe that they are overpaying influencers. It's a very hot topic. I, I can see your, cho your chuckle, Kyle. Um, what are some strategies your teams are using, specifically Emily and Sarah, to strategically invest your budgets? And Kyle, I have another one for you as a follow-up, so we'll come back to you. <laughs> sure. Emily, um, so we, what we're careful to do with the contracting is agree with the client in advance, like what rights they're going to need, what kind of longevity of content they want, any exclusive periods, any paid spend behind it. So those are all things that can, if you try and negotiate it later on, really push the cost up. So you can be kind of smart up front. We're also running hundreds of campaigns all the time. So we're kind of really aware of like market rate and what you'd expect to pay for a certain campaign or a certain number of pieces of content in a certain sector. Obviously, know, it varies a bit if you're working with like a healthcare professional compared to like a mum or something. But mm -hmm. yeah, you can, be, you can be kind of smart up front, I think, to keep things efficient and then kind of having a knowledge of the industry is also helpful. But I think like, I mean, marketing managers kind of have, like Maya was saying earlier, like pressure on their budgets. But I think if you're comparing it to other options that you could be spending your budget on, like a Super Bowl commercial is what, like six or seven million, or like there's a whole kind of range of options available to you as a marketing manager. So actually, I think influencer, even though the prices are increasing, still represents really good value. Mm -hmm. I think um, my biggest advice for that is. Um, always be willing to uh, at least try negotiating prices mm -hmm. um, on a per influencer basis. Um, especially nowadays, I feel like, again, dependent on the influencer, but I think some influencers will be willing to be more flexible on pricing because they just really wanna work with your brand. Mm. Um, others might want to fill a spot in their content calendar and they haven't been able to find other brands to do so. Um, so you, it never really hurts to ask. Um, I know that at KiwiCo, like we have cut anywhere from like 10 to 60% off initial influencer rates just by talking to them and asking. So I think that's a really big strategy on the brand side to make sure we're, that we're not overpaying. Mm -hmm. um, but I think another thing to consider is just being wary of budget and goals against like the size of following, the platform it's going on, the deliverable. Um, so what we've found is that um, Instagrammer rates tend to scale with their size of following a lot more rapidly than the sales that they drive will. Mm. Um, so at KiwiCo, we actually set a cost cap um, whenever it's an Instagram influencer just to keep that under control. Um, and we actually also do the same thing for TikTok. It's for a very different reason, I think, one of the unique things about TikTok is that you can have virtually no following and go viral. So we don't need to necessarily tap into your size of audience, even though you know there's a reason that they built that size of audience. So we'll send, we'll kind of keep a cost cap there as well. Um, and again, going back to like YouTube and blog posts, I think that's really um, where we've found our sweet spot in terms of. Um, balancing cost versus the sales that they can drive, because that's ultimately the goal. Kyle, 
Continuing uh, on this topic of influencer fees, one of the strategies our team has utilized is hybrid payments, you know, paying a creator a flat fee plus commission or performance incentive. We found smaller creators are really receptive to this, small and medium creators, but larger creators, especially those with agents, can uh, push back a little bit more. You are an agent, so I'm curious to learn how you're navigating these conversations. Yeah, I um, I hate the mix. I'm just gonna be straight up. Like I, we don't um, generally espouse that we accept like a lower rate mm -hmm. um, and a cost per performance type of model just to like protect our talent. You know, I'm as a talent manager, uh, my goal is is not to gouge our clients. I would say we are the most reasonable talent management firm in the game, which is why we've been around for so long. Um, but we like to build these long-term relationships. And, you know, if we're talking about creators, um, I think for me it's, it's a bit different because my first creator was my wife. And then after that it was like a bunch of her friends. So it's like the care and concern and how I thought about building rates around these people was, okay, they are creatives, they are photographers, they're writers, they're videographers, they're doing all these different things. And then they've built these dynamic communities around them, right? So there is a cost model that I created in terms of how I'm uh, establishing rates with them. And in my opinion, our cost model is very fair, the way that we typically negotiate, and we're always willing to negotiate with our partners. I think if you have a talent out there, an influencer talent that's not willing to negotiate, that's not a partner, mm -hmm. right? So I just wanna put that out there. But um, when we give rates over to the brand or the agency that we're working with, we actually break down every single line item. Mm. I know a lot of other, talent management firms the way that they do this, or even talent if they're self-representing, they'll just give a bulk rate and say, here's what it is. Mm -hmm. um, but we always break it down. So we want our, our partners to feel like, okay, if you can't meet the base rate for whatever reason, let's take something out or let's switch it. Like, yeah. uh, if we're gonna lower the budget, let's lower the scope. Mm -hmm. You know, like let's meet in the middle and figure out something that works. When it comes to pay per, pay per performance as an additive thing, the way I've always felt is that it devalues, again, the, the fact that this person is a creator. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know that's how we came into this conversation today. It's, uh, it's social media, not selling media, right? I love affiliate link programming as an additive component so that we can measure, so that we can see what the results were, um, and then we can actually build on that success. But, uh, and I'm, you know, in a lot of ways, I think even if, um, we do that from the outset, but the commission's really low. We keep our base rate high to honor what they're creating and the community that they've built, but we still say, cool, we're gonna put the affiliate in there at a low rate, just so you get the data. The data is valuable for everybody. Hmm. And I would never argue against that, neither would my talent, because then we can continue to sell off that data. Um, but I'm like, pay the creators. I actually would say that we are underpaying these creators because we're coming from a, a model where we used to make commercials for thousands, if not millions of dollars, or you know, other forms of uh, advertising that were so much more expensive than we're paying these people. Mm -hmm. And if you're working with me, you're working with some of the best creators in the field. So you know, we've got to pay those people for, for what they're doing, and it's still a tiny fraction of what brands are paying for these other you know, traditional channels that we're moving away from. I'm curious, do you have an example of a time where you were negotiating with a brand and you were working within their budget constraints but had to negotiate on behalf of your creator? Anything, any example come to mind for you? Oh yeah, I mean I do this every day, uh, sure. it, like of, of what happened. Yeah, just, you know, brands have specific budgets and you know the point about meeting specific KPIs. Is there a time that stands out to you where you had to, or maybe a, a creator that you were representing really wanted to work with the brand, but the budget only had X amount of dollars and you were trying to make it work. How do you, do you navigate that conversation? Yeah, so, you know, as I was kind of just explaining and I think is a really great framework for everybody to take away, when it comes to negotiation, the way it should be done is that you get a menu in a, in a sense. Like, here's exactly what you're paying for. A lot of fees today aren't even really around the content development. A lot of the fees today are built on uh, usage, you know, access to that content over a specific period of time. The likeness, you know, okay, I wanna use the likeness of your talent for another year, or I don't want um, this talent to work with a competitor for six months or a year. That's where the bigger, um, 
the bigger fees start to get built in. Mm -hmm. But where we find like a really reasonable come to the middle is generally, okay, cool, I've only got $10,000, $5,000, $50,000, whatever it might be. What generally can I get for that? Okay, here's my line item of every little thing, including the exclusivity, including how long you can use it for with likeness, et cetera, et cetera. And if those numbers don't match up, then each side has to be willing to give a little bit, say, okay, cool, let's take out this story set because I know it's not actually related to my KPI. I think one of the biggest mistakes we see from brands all the time is that they want usage rights around, um, around the, the content that's being produced for like, they, they just make it up. It'll be six mm -hmm. months, three months, whatever, but they're not actually intending to use it for that long. They're really only intending to use it in a newsletter that's going out that week, but they want the rights for three months. Sure. And so that's when we're like, okay, cool, it's gonna cost you $10,000 for six months of usage rights. But you're only gonna use it, you're telling me you're only gonna use it for two weeks. Let's trim that down. Can you do that? And then we end up in the middle. We end up like, everything ends up making sense. Sure, finding that happy medium is definitely right. a theme for this conversation. Um, I know we just have a couple minutes left before q and I'm curious, um, Emily and Sarah, if you could share some advice for anyone looking to enable or bring together an affiliate, uh, excuse me, an influencer program that um, is through the affiliate channel specifically, any advice to share with our audience? I think coming from the brand side, um, measuring success is a big one, and my advice around that would be don't define success only by last click sales, though obviously, you know, a lot of orgs, including mine, like we're held to those metrics. Um, like at KiwiCo, we definitely look at last click sales, but we also apply like a multiplier on the trackable last click sales. And so we measure ROAS based on two to four X what they actually drove through last click because we know through looking at different data like post-purchase survey results um, that, that they have a much wider impact. Um, and obviously it's gonna be different at every brand, brand based on like analytics and goal setting, but I think it's always worth noting that like influencers are realistically never going to see the same ROAS as coupon sites probably. Um, so it's just worth considering and having those conversations internally. Yeah, and I just add, that I'd be really clear from the outset about the KPIs that you're tracking around the audience you're trying to reach, and those are things that enable you to be as efficient as possible in terms of like reaching influencers at the right kind of level. So you're not like not necessarily a celebrity, but maybe a more niche or macro one. So having a really clear idea of yeah your goals and then how it will fit into any other wider marketing as well, so you can really, yeah, think about the point that they play in the funnel, so whether that's driving sales, building awareness, uh, that's, yeah, useful. Fantastic. Sounds like knowing your goals is definitely a, a key place to start. Now, we do have a few minutes for some Q&A. Um, if you have a question, please let us know. Uh, we do have a mic that you can raise your hand if you have a question, we can come around. Um, anyone? We got one. Hi, I wanted to ask you guys, what do you think is the next era of influencing that's coming around the corner? That's a good question. Very much a Taylor Swift theme going on. Yeah. <laughs> and I was actually going to uh, counter this that we're in the renaissance of influence because I just saw the Beyonce concert, so. Um, <laughs> yeah, in the next era, I've, I don't even know, like to be totally honest, that there is a next era um, because some, as somebody who's been doing this for so long, I keep hearing the same things over and over, and we have such short memories that we're like, literally every Q1, somebody brings up Pinterest. And we all laugh, and we're like, oh, Pinterest. And then we forget about it, and it kind of goes away. <laughs> um, and then we were talking over lunch about Snapchat, and Snapchat is definitely having a moment right now, and it's really cool, and it's really interesting. But at least from my side, on the talent management side, we're not getting any inquiries for Snapchat campaigns from our talent. But there is something interesting going on there. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's like I keep seeing, I keep here, you know, having this question of like what's next, but it ends up kind of continuing to be the same things. And I do believe part of that is because we're still figuring out 
what we're actually doing. And I understand that especially with partners like CJ, like the tech is getting so much better. It's just the tech and the reporting. Um, at the beginning of this year, everybody just wanted to hear data, data, data because we had a very soft holiday and you know, lots of the platforms really lost it, like Meta um, during the holiday season and Q1 was soft. But now that they've made adjustments to the platforms and the data is getting better and that's driving more powerful conversations about who we should be partnering and who we should be putting up in front of our brand and who, who we should be aligning with. So I don't know, it's, it's a renaissance and I'm there. Just gotta keep your ear to the ground. So I'd just jump in and say one thing that I think is gonna be interesting. There's a lot around generative AI in marketing in general. So I think like how that can be used for virtual influencers. So we're seeing like, we've created a few for clients like Renault already, but yeah, we're seeing at the moment maybe just novelty value, but actually higher levels of engagement with virtual influencers. So yeah, if you think about kind of layering on the script, layering on video, that yeah, it gives quite an interesting space for brands to play in, I think, either generating their own or like working with one that's virtual. I actually think the next era is um, kind of what Christina mentioned earlier is uh, just de related to de-influencing. We're seeing on the brand side that in studio ads and anything that immediately feels like a commercial or ad is just not performing at all. Mm -hmm. So I think influencer content will continue to be increasingly used as ads, um, but in a way that feels more authentic and relatable. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of emerging technologies to make that easier for brands to, there are already ones that exist, to bring that creative into their portfolio so they can then use those in ads and find ways to scale that and find content that's already existing and going and securing usage rights for those pieces of content. Any other questions? I see some hands way in the back and maybe one in front. Hi, thank you. Kyle, we've worked together before. Jessica Armstrong, <laughs> meet you in person. Um, I actually had a question for you and I would love to perhaps try and change your opinion. Oh shit. Um, <laughs> going back to the hybrid approach on creator fees, I know you say you hate them, but we absolutely would say, in my opinion, for our advertiser, knowing that we can secure a lower, you know, flat fee with the incentivization of an increased commission rate, um, you know, in your opinion, is there a commission rate that would change your mind? Because we do know there's creators who are really excited to work with brands and monetize their content and, you know, if, if, for instance, throwing a number out there, if a 20% commission rate for someone who is already influencing their creator, you know, their audiences, um, where do you draw that line? Because for us, we feel there is value there. Um, I, I don't know that you're changing my mind. I, I think, like, <laughs> one, one thing that I will say about myself is that I am, and I, hopefully I've shown that in some of my responses today, I'm very flexible as a partner. And so I love, like, more commission is great. Um, I think that it works best kind of maybe after the test phase. And, I, and that's, you know, what Sarah was talking about a bit with Kiwi. Like, if we do really well in that first test, or actually if we even do moderate, we've got to bring it down a little bit to keep the conversation going. Like, okay, cool, that would work for me because I want to prove the impact. And a test scenario, will, even if, you know, again, we start with a very low commission rate, but a reasonable base rate, it will allow us both to see, does this actually work for the community that we're trying to impact? Like, does XYZ influencers community care about this product? Because that is a, you know, that's something you gotta figure out um, in that first go. So, I'm not gonna say, you know, 20, 30, 40, What's 50% your won't. <laughs> <laughs> Won't turn my head, but um, at least out the gate, I want to see a, a respect for what they're creating, a respect. And again, I say the word respect because I believe that we are very reasonable about how we approach rates. Um, and uh, you know, if anybody in the room wants to argue with me who has experience working with me, I'll take it. Um, but uh, but yeah, so let's chat. <laughs> you got it. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Right in the front. 
Sarah, this question's for you. I think near the top of the discussion, you mentioned how you think about Instagram and Reels, um, influencer marketing, more of like upper, upper funnel metrics, like awareness, consideration driving. So I'm just curious how you measure success of that piece of your influencer campaign and as a KPI, because that's obviously a very challenging KPI. If you're le leveraging brand studies, what your solutions are if you're working with a publisher partner who manages your influencer campaigns or if you're doing it independently, it's something that's historically challenging for a lot of advertisers to prove success on. To be totally transparent, if it's my budget, I don't, I try not to book Instagram reels and TikToks at all, um, just because, especially because there's no like clickable link um, where it's easy tracking. Um, I will only do it if paid social is kind of helping me so then they can really scale those sales out. Um, as far as Instagram though, we have seen some success with stories, again, just because there is that clickable link obviously with a caveat that it's only up for 24 hours and that's why we have that cost cap in place and also keep in mind size of following so that they still have enough reach for that 24 hours to be valuable. Um, but yeah, so it kind of depends on where the budget is coming from. And, but we do like, as far as measuring success internally, we do have that multiplier in place. So even if they're driving say five sales, we might calculate ROAS based on, you know, 15, 20, um, so that it's just, yeah, we, I know that it's different at every brand, but that's how we do it at Kiwico. Got it, I was just curious more how you're measuring the awareness piece of that as a key. Awareness, we look a lot at um, engagements and impressions, but okay. we work, we've worked individually with influencers through their agents, but also through networks, right. through CJI, so right. it kind of depends on um, what the capabilities are and what they're willing to share with us. Any last questions? Going once, going twice. There's an interesting oh. question in, the, in sure. the app. It says, typically, how much budget would you recommend a brand utilize for a single market campaign? Uh, sorry, say that again. Typically, how? What is, what is the budget that you would recommend for a typical influencer campaign? For a one and done? For a one market single market campaign? There's a lot of variables. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 mean, I think there's a lot of variables. I would say like 30,000 minimum. I'm just making that up though. Yeah. <laughs> it depends on what you're trying to achieve. Um, it depends on who you're trying to reach, what channels you want to activate. I think there's a lot of variables, but I'm more than happy to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with anyone that wants to chat further if I can be helpful. Yeah. You can find us, whoever you are in the app. Well, fantastic. Thank you, Emily, Kyle, and Sarah for being here, for answering all of the questions. Please give a round of applause for all of our panelists.